The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. During the past few days, Equitable Society representatives have mailed out postcards to certain exceptional people. Men and women whom the Equitable Society representatives classify as slated for success in their business or professional careers. The kind of people who should be interested in the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. In about 14 minutes, I'll give you full details on this special plan for every man who has faith in himself and his future. It is offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Surplus Safe Crackers. At this time of the year, the rotogravure and magazine sections of your Sunday paper are filled with pictures of people enjoying themselves at the many winter resorts in this country. At most of those places, the cares that burden people the rest of the year are forgotten. We all take such a respite from our labors when the opportunity presents itself. However, even in those carefree moments, it is well to remember that crime takes no vacation. Crime is a 24-hour-a-day, 12-month-a-year business. And unlike some fields, the business of crime is booming. In the past year, for instance, more major crimes were committed than in any previous year in the nation's history. A survey just completed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation has revealed that the number of those major crimes reached the unprecedented total of almost a million seven hundred thousand. That is alarming enough. But a close study of the records brings forth a fact that is even more shocking. In the entire year covered by the survey, there was not a single hour, day or night, when crime took a holiday. <laughs> Tonight's file opens in a suite of rooms in a southern resort hotel. In the living room of this apartment, a well-dressed man nervously paces the floor. Who's that? It's me. I thought you were coming down to the beach, George. I couldn't. Why not? I've been waiting here for two hours for your brother, Chuck. He's on the beach. The beach? I just left him there. Well, that does it. That really does it. Does what? Hello, look at me. I'm white as a con man's collar. I ain't been in the sunshine since I got here. You want to know why? Because I've been busy setting up jobs. Jobs that your chowderhead brother has fouled up on me. Now, wait a minute. What about that Redlands caper? All we needed on that was a guy to walk in the front door, put a little soup in the safe when we get enough diamonds to cover a grapefruit. So what happens? Your brother digs us up a genius who blows a whole wall up a three-story house. That wasn't Chuck's fault. The guy had a good rep, and you know it. What about that last bum he found? He gets the jewelry and falls down the front steps, knocks himself out, and winds up in a clink. Do you think Chuck pushed him? All I think is that the season's almost over, and we ain't made a score yet. Hiya, folks. Get out of here. Huh? I said get out of here. What's with him, sis? His chin and his ulcer. I thought I told you to be here two hours ago. I've been working. On the beach? Look, you asked me to find somebody to bust open the safe. Well, I did. No. Oh. I was talking to Willie Page. Willie Page couldn't break up on a pack of cigarettes. I'm not referring to him. Willie tipped me off where to find two of the best peep men in the business. Now, oh, what's their names? Putnam and Morgan. Putnam and Morgan have been dead for years. That ain't so. They retired. They're living over in Sunshine City. I'd like to believe that. Willie gave me an address. Why don't I go over and see? Are they any good, George? Any good? I used to be able to blow the skin off a grape. Chuck, I'm giving you one more chance. Go over to Sunshine City and don't come back without them. A 
Hold this. Mm. Your move. Mm. I know. Well, make it, make it. Very well, Herbert. Any shadow. Oh. 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 Oh, goodness. <laughs> you insisted, Herbert. <clears throat> like play another? No, no, I, uh, I think I'll go watch some, uh, shuffleboard. Either of you men named Putnam? I'm Mr. Putnam. You must be Otis Morgan. Yeah, that's right. Hi. My name's Chuck Adams. Hello. Yeah, I do, Mr. Adams. We're looking all over town for you. That guy playing shuffleboard finally pointed you out. Well, uh, oh, why were you looking for us? Willie Page told me to come over and see you. It's about a job. I got a safe I want open. And uh, Willie recommended us? That's right. Well, that, that's very flattering. Like to handle it? No. Why not? Safe cracking is a young man's profession. You mean you've lost your touch? Well, I should say not. We're as good now as we ever were. But I don't get it. It's the uh, working conditions, young man. The late hours, the long getaway rides. Look, I can knock that out. This job is all cased. You just come back with me today and do the job tomorrow. Well, we're in a shuffleboard tournament tomorrow. Oh, now, wait a now, minute. Now, that isn't why we're, we're turning you down. We're just not interested. Not even if I told you there was a hundred grand worth of ice in this box? That I'd guarantee you 20%? Mr. Adams, if you guaranteed us 100%, we would be interested. When we hung up our blow torches, we finished all good. <laughs> at Bay City, winner number four, Simon's Dream. Ah, nuts. Second number one, Noel's Pal. Third number eight, Wolf Herbert. George, will you shut winner that off? Four, I'm listening to the results. You lost the race. The win, but I want to hear it. Well, I Wait. don't. After all your beefing, you finally get to the beach, and what happens? You sit under an umbrella and listen to ball games and race results. I gotta do something till that brother of yours shows. It's a long way to Sunshine City. He should have been back this morning. I've been that trip a dozen times. Well, uh, maybe something delayed him. Hey. Hmm? Look down the beach. What? Throw in the ball to that blonde. That's your brother. Yeah, it is. Hey, Chuck! Chuck! Come here. Okay, okay. See you later, honey. I swear to you, Helen, I'm going to kill him. I'll rip him apart right here on the beach. Hey, where you been? I've been looking for you. You've been looking for us? Why, you knucklehead? Yeah, quiet. When did you get back? Just a little while ago. I went to the hotel. You weren't there. I came down to the beach to find you. And instead you found a blonde. George, will you stop? Chuck, what happened in Sunshine City? I saw the old guys. Made them a proposition. They turned me down cold. Why? They're retired. Why couldn't you talk him out of it? I tried. All day I tried. Well, what do we do now, George? I'm going to Sunshine City. But if they've retired... I got you... an angle. I spent three weeks casing this job, and I'm going to get paid for it. I'll have them blowing that safe tomorrow night. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Walter Franklin. Yes, Jim. The SAC just put us on a new one. Oh? What's the story? Did you read about a jewel robbery a few weeks ago? A family named Campbell? Yes. I think I did. It was a local case, wasn't it? Up to this morning. We're in it now. The police in New York knocked over a fence and found the loot. I've just been down to police headquarters going over the file. What did you get? Modus operandi, mostly. A butler admitted a man in a messenger's uniform who said he had a package for Mr. Campbell. Then, as the butler reached for it, the messenger flattened it. Hmm. Any idea? No, but the same pattern has been used in two other local robberies, both unsuccessful. So there's a chance they're still in town? Yeah, could be. Let's interview the people who were assaulted at all three homes and have a composite picture made of that messenger, huh? Have you got the addresses? Yeah, two are over on the bay and one is up the other side of the causeway. Uh, here. Wall, will you take the one up town? Okay, Jim. I'll visit the other two, and we'll meet back here. There. There they are, George. What? Where? The old guy's playing shuffleboard. Oh. 
Okay, you wait here. Yeah. Go on, Otis. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Beverly. Oh, you knocked me right into minus ten. <laughs> so I did. Uh, Mr. Putnam, Mr. Morgan. That's right. The name's George Bedford. Yeah. Oh, how do you do, how Mr. Do you do, how do you do? I, uh, I've come here to straighten out a little misunderstanding. Oh, what's that? A fellow named Chuck Adams came here to see you yesterday. Made you a proposition to, uh, uh, blow a safe. Oh, well, yes, that's right. And we told him we weren't interested. <laughs> Well, I don't think he gave you the right picture. You see, this whole job ain't a money-making deal. It's a, a, a benefit. A benefit? Yes. Everybody does the job for free. Mm. That's not very profitable. Did you ever hear of an old-timer named Tiger Young? Oh, of course, yes. We, we were all away together. Uh, all did five years. What about it? Well, uh, he passed away a month ago. Oh, Goodness no. me. Oh, you see, this know. benefit is going to be run for his widow. Every bit of loot from the job goes to her. Oh, how nice. Uh, what kind of a job was this again, Mr. Bitford? Private home on a small island in the bay. We got it all cased. There won't be any trouble. Uh, what kind of a safe? Small wall job. <laughs> we can open that guy with a spoon, can't we? <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, gentlemen? Well, if it's for Tiger Young's widow, you've brought us out of retirement. Phillips, uh, Washington. Anything on that composite picture? No, not yet. We sent it two days ago. Yeah, I put a red sticker on it. Should have an answer soon. Mm -hmm. Could be that the messenger has no record. Oh, I doubt it. The jobs are done by phone. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, uh, I went back to see the butler at the Campbell house. Huh? Showed him the composite picture. Oh, what do you think? Well, he said the artist did a good job. Oh, no, Jim, hey, wait a minute. Come on. I've been coming in on the picture now. Your suspect believed to be Charles Adams, alias Chuck Adams. Yeah, his record's coming in, too. Chuck Adams? I don't know. Well, let's check in with the local police, see if we can find him. Hey, tell him. I'm right here. One boat circle the island. Bunch of kids. That's all? Yeah. How to go at the house in trouble? Nah. What about the servants? Chuck tapped out the butler, tied the other two up. Mm -hmm. Where's Chuck? He's with the old guys. How are they doing? Just about finished. So soon? Mm hmm. Let's go with the boat. We'll wait for him there. Okay. Were you there when they opened the safe? Yeah. It's a real good score. Oh, I'd say we're getting a boat. Hey. Hey, that sounds like our boat. I told Chuck not to start the motor till we got there. Hey, hey look, George, it's pulling away. Yeah, come on. Look at that dirty double crosser. He's heading right for shore. I don't get it. You don't, huh? George, look. What? They're on the pier. Somebody stretched out. George, it's Chuck. Yeah. Is he breathing? Unfortunately, yes. Here, wait a minute. What? Here's the paper pinned to his shirt. What is it? Yeah, there's some writing on it. Where's your lighter? Yeah, I'll get it. Yeah. It's from the old guys. What did you say? Dear friends, we checked this afternoon. Atlanta Tiger Young is still alive. Therefore, since he has no widow, we are making this a benefit for us. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to this exciting file which shows how your FBI helps protect the security of America. Now a quick look at the future of America as we stand on the threshold of the 1950s. What do these next ten years have in store for us? What do the experts say? The prosperity forecast for the next ten years is fair and sunny. New industries like television, prefabricated houses... And atomic power development will set the pace for what may prove to be the greatest advance ever scored by American industry. 
to take the lead in this march of progress, there will be a crying need for men and women with energy, brains, and character. Do those words describe you? Are you the type of person who refuses to be held down? If so, then one thing is certain. The Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up will strongly appeal to you. The three important advantages this plan offers were made to order for your type of person. First, as your salary goes up, your insurance can keep pace with it. When you get that better job or that big promotion comes your way, you can adjust your insurance to measure up to your increased income. Secondly, while you're waiting, your wife and children have the life insurance protection they need. This means that you have the peace of mind, the freedom from worry about your family. That's essential to a man who wants to concentrate on getting ahead. Third advantage, the equitable plan is flexible at all times. It can expand or contract as you see fit and offers you many desirable options, which your Equitable Society representative will be glad to explain to you. So why not get in touch with him right away? Phone him and ask for full details on the Equitable Plan for people on the way up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to the FBI file, the surplus safe cracker. Perhaps it surprised some of you listening to this case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation to learn that two old men, seemingly as harmless as this pair, could be safe crackers. Their gentility of manner and of living certainly belied that fact which serves as another example of something your FBI has tried before to impress on you listeners. It is physically impossible by visual means alone to tell whether or not any person is a decent citizen or a wanted criminal. There are few people anywhere who at one time or another have not been tempted to do something wrong. The average person has not yielded to temptation, has remained the person who works for what he gets. The others... The ones who have taken what seems to be the easy way have become criminals. In ancient times, and until very recently in some countries, it was possible to tell the difference between an honest man and a thief. For in those places, once a man had been found guilty of stealing, his thumb was branded with a capital T. Your FBI would frown completely on a resumption of any such barbaric practice. But until another foolproof method of distinguishing is discovered, it can advise you to do only one thing. Treat all strangers with respect, but also with caution. Tonight's file continues at the FBI field office. Anything in on the Chuck Adams alarm, Jim? Yeah, we haven't located him yet, but he was in action again last night. Where? On an island out on the bay. Well, how come we're just lying about it? A family named Webster lives there. They spent the night in town. When they got home this morning, they found the butler unconscious. The same pattern used from beginning to end. Not only that, this time we know it was Adams. How? Well, the police showed the butler one of our pictures of Adams, and he made positive identification. Good. There's only one variation, Walt. According to the police report, blow torches were used to melt the hinges on the safe. They used soup on their other job. I can't understand what made them go back to this whole place. Oh, pardon me, Walt. I'm sure. Best Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, Captain. You have where? Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot. Bye. Well, to this police headquarters. Oh. Chuck Adams is believed to be living at the Surf Hotel. I'm going over there. I'll get it, Otis. Yes, all right. Hello? Yes? was this? Oh. I see. Well, thank you very much for the information. Goodbye. Now, who was that, Herbert? The desk clerk. Oh? Huh? And what did he want? Said he'd just gotten a long-distance call. It was a man inquiring whether we were still in the hotel. Oh. That would be Mr. Bedford. Mm, I imagine so. Wasn't that nice for the hotel to tip us off? Indeed it was. So... Well, we better finish packing. Any room left in your suitcase? Mm, a little. Mm. You take the rest of the towels. 
right. Yeah, but you sure you want to go to Greenville by boat? Oh, yes, yes, old sir. It'll be much safer. Yeah, but you do get seasick. I, I uh, bought some seasick pills. Well, nothing left to do now but tie the sheets together, throw them out the window. Think we ought to go so early? The boat doesn't leave for two hours. I know. But checkout time at this hotel is two o'clock. They've been so nice to us. There's no point in cheating them out of an extra day. <laughs> Maybe they're playing shuffleboard. Not with those bed sheets strung out the window. Oh. Let's go over the joint. Maybe they left some. Okay. Uh, nothing. Well, this thing's empty. George. Huh? Did you find something? This telegram is in the basket. What does it say? Nice to hear from you boys after so many years. Yes, and still in same business. Be glad to see you. Thank Goldie. Well, where's it from? Um, Greenville. It must be from Goldie Leonard. Who? An old-time fence. Come on. We're heading for Greenville, too. got a couple of minutes yet before our plane leaves. Where are we going? Sunshine City. For Chuck Adams? No, no. Mr. Adams is resting comfortably at the city jail. I rested him two hours ago. At the Surf Hotel? That's right. Get anything from him? Yeah, quite a bit. Said he worked for his brother-in-law, a man named George Bedford. He told me that Bedford, his wife, and two safe crackers were with him last night on Webster's Island. How does that lead us to Sunshine City? The two safe crackers come from there. Oh, they, uh, they double-crossed Bedford, incidentally. They took the loot from the job. He and his wife have gone to look for them. Did you get a description of her? Yeah, and the safe crackers. There are a couple of old timers named uh, Herbert Putnam and Otis Morgan. Come on, Walt. That's our plane. Find anything, Walt? Through this wastebasket. Mm-hmm. I've come up with a Western Union envelope, but no sign of a wire. How'd you make out? I described George Bedford and his wife to the desk clerk. He said they were here this afternoon looking for the two old men. They said they'd be back? No, but we might find out where they went. I questioned the doorman. He said they left her in a taxi. He locates the cab driver to call us. What do you got there? Sales clerk. Huh? Anything I have, Mice? No. There's some prices from the cash register. Could be from a local store. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Yes, yeah, speaking. You did? How long ago? Oh, I see. Yes, thanks very much. That was the doorman, Walter. He just spoke to the cab driver. He drove them to the airport, said they took an afternoon plane to Greenville. That's, uh, well, uh, they've landed already. Yeah. Did you find anything else in that basket? The... Uh, a couple of pamphlets and empty tobacco pouches, gum wrappers, soap wrappers, some old newspapers. Well, let's check Western Union on the telegram and local stores in that sales set. Come on. Hey, what's the delay, Herbert? They're just lowering the gangplank. Uh, how do you feel? Oh, much better. Much better. <laughs> Those seasick pills didn't help much. I'm afraid not. And gangplank's down. Oh, so it is. Well, let's get off. Greenville's uh, changed. Uh, uh, careful going down the gangplank. <laughs> we did our first job here, Otis. Remember? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Sweet little ivy-covered bank. 
Yeah. Well, probably a big stone skyscraper now. No, probably. Uh, let's go over there anyway and browse around. Oh, right? right. wise guys. Yeah. Why, it's Mr. and Mrs. Bedford. That's right. I got a gun in this coat pocket. Just keep walking down the field. Yeah, but we oh, do as he says, old is. Mm -hmm. Well, it was nice of you to meet us. Yeah. Wasn't it? This is far enough. Now, I'll take that jewelry. I'm afraid you can't have it. Why not? It's against our principle. Look, I'm not going to argue with you. Either I get that jewelry now, or you two are going to fall off this pier. Now, get it up. I'm afraid we must refuse. Okay, then, any go. Just don't stand where you are. Oh, thank heaven you you saved our lives. Who are you? Special agent of the FBI. Push us in, Mr. Bedford. Mr. Bedford is joining you in a trip to headquarters. George and Helen Bedford, Chuck Adams, Herbert Putnam, and Otis Morgan were each sentenced to 10-year prison term for a violation of the Interstate Transportation of Stolen Property Act. Special Agents Taylor and Franklin checked the clues found in the hotel room in Sunshine City. These clues were a telegram envelope and a sales slip. The telegram company could give them nothing on the first lead, but the second brought results. The sales slip was found to have been issued by a drugstore adjacent to the hotel. A visit to the drugstore revealed that Herbert Putnam had been in earlier that afternoon to purchase a package of pills that would prevent seasickness. Agent Taylor contacted local steamship companies and learned that the only ship leaving that day had Greenville as its destination. So, two special agents, aided by the men and machines of the FBI identification section in Washington, were able to remove from circulation four more criminals, four more enemies of the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting FBI file. Now one last word on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. It's a plan for the man who's looking forward to the day when his boss will say to him, Jim, the board of directors approved your idea, and we've appointed you to head the department. If you are that kind of man, then get in touch with an Equitable Society representative for full information on the Equitable Society's life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The story of two vicious criminals whose efforts to escape involved them in a blazing forest fire. Its subject, impersonation. Its title, The Fiery Fugitive. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were B. Benadera, Tom Brown, Bill Conrad, Herb Ellis, Bill Johnstone, and Victor Rodman. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Fiery Fugitives on This Is Your FBI. The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, fun for the whole family, following immediately over most of these ABC stations. Stay tuned.